Okay, I was given the broad topic of computing for climate modeling. So rather than sort of get stuck in sort of operational detail, I thought that I would just oops, just give sort of an overview of how supercomputers work since they're so vital to how you do climate science. So um, what is a supercomputer? Um, there's actually no real proper definition of it. It really just means better than all the other computers. <laughs> and that has changed a lot over history, of course. Um, but the, the sort of predominant feature of them, particularly these days, is their clusters. Because you cannot build a vaster computer. You really just build more and more computers and make sure that they can skillfully talk to each other. And that's how you achieve big calculations. And what do we, and I guess I didn't write this here, but when you talk about high performance computing, you really are talking about using a supercomputer. And it's really not much more than that. Um, so what are supercomputers used for? Um, I didn't put these in the order of popularity. I put them in the order of interest <coughs> to this audience. Um, the main one is, I mean, the main one of interest here is weather and climate. Um, I mean, they're important because weather and climate modeling are really just massive fluid dynamics problems with lots of arbitrary forcings. And that requires manipulation of so many millions of numbers that you pretty much need a lot of computers to do it. Um, but really, the interest of the reasons these computers get built is probably number two and number four. <laughs> um, petroleum exploration is very important. That, again, is not a fluid problem. It's a solid physics problem. But it's bouncing waves around, and it needs lots of math. And there's tremendous amounts of money involved in it. <laughs> um, quantum chemistry is another one. Again, it's just a problem with a lot of degrees of freedom. Um, and the one, probably the most important one in, in terms of the economics, is nuclear testing. Uh, you can't really ignite nuclear bombs anymore, thanks to all the treaties. So nowadays, they simulate them on computers at places <laughs> like Los Alamos and others. I'm sure every country does it. Um, so I just thought I'd go over some of the biggest ones to kind of give an idea. Uh, this list was updated two days ago, so you're getting cutting edge knowledge here. <laughs> um, China, China just released its massive one, the Tianhe 2, uh, Milky Way 2. Um, it's the biggest, it can do 34 petaflops. Who knows what a flop is? Who knows? Nobody. Why? Oh, some here. Uh, it's a floating point operation. You can just think of it as one mathematical manipulation. Um, so it's kind of a measure of the performance, although I'll get into how to actually kind of interpret that a little more. Um, but yeah, it's a 34 petaflop. It's exciting, not just because it was built by a military organization, but <laughs> it's also used for oil. Um, <laughs> but um, it it's, it's uses the new Xeon 5 cards, which are these really awesome cards Intel just built, which are these basically 60 processor things you plug in and out. and so. The Xiangdei 2 is the first example of a massive Xeon Phi computer. So it's a very cool computer. And it was just, the numbers were just released two days ago, so I had to change my slides immediately. Um, this was the number one when I originally wrote this. This is Titan. This is a um, another government military computer. Um, it's, it's, um, it's special in the sense, it's, it's petaflop rating is half of the Xiangdei, but um, it was number one three days ago. And <laughs> the, I think the special thing about Titan is that it's one of these CPU-GPU hybrids where it uses lots of Xeon CPUs to do stuff. And then I want to say NVIDIA, some sort of NVIDIA graphics card to complement the mathematics. And so it, it's, it, it's a proven case that CPU-GPU hybrids can get high performance. Um, the next one is Sequoia. It's another government, U.S. government computer. <laughs> uh, I, I forget what it's used for a lot, but it, it's, I think it has some more academic um, use. But it's another one. It, it's, it's, it's more your standard cluster. I think it's somewhat similar to Raijin, the computer here. Um, I, I guess Sequoia is also quite known for being um, energy efficient compared to the others. Does anyone know how much energy these computers actually use? They, they're on the order of megawatts. And um, so I, think, I think this one, oh, I shouldn't mention, these lights actually change color depending on how much like, power they're using. <laughs> but but um, I think this is a 30 megawatt computer or something, or 20 megawatt. Um, this one's about 10 megawatt. And this one is 2 megawatt, I think. So I think it's quite, um, 
I think that's one of its notable points. Uh, this one is here um, because it was number three before. It's the K computer. Uh, I guess the thing about all these is they all were former number ones as well. Um, the K computer is also a bit of a cluster computer, but um, I guess an interesting note about it is it has a very sophisticated interconnection system where um, it's very heavily wired, and I guess topologically it's called six dimensional. It's a tofu interconnect. But um, yeah, so these are just some of the major computers around right now. And um, this is and this is Australia's top computer, which is <laughs> number 27. It was 24. <laughs> uh, it it all oh, it, it was built to be a petaflop computer. It almost made it 980. 0.98 petaflop. It, it's it's optimal is one is 1.1 petaf petaflop. But it almost got there. Um, uh, Raijin was built by Fujitsu, um, just like uh, the K computer, though architecturally they don't really resemble each other terribly. Um, you can see it actually has a pretty low CPU count compared to the others, which are in the millions. Uh, this is 54,000. That's sort of a reflection of the nature of the processor, which is a very beefy Intel cache processor, like in your PCs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Raijin, I think, is interesting because it is a kind of normal supercomputer using actually quite normal components that still come together to produce pretty pretty good calculations. I should say Raijin was just turned on for the public on Monday, so um, we'll see if what I said is actually true. <laughs> but um, it's meant to be, it's, if, it, if it follows its predecessor, it should be a use, as useful as the previous one has been. Um, so, you know, the, we have these numbers, we have these, these petaflop and, you know, number of CPUs, some people talk about how much memory they have. You know, you see a lot of numbers People try to make them as big. They say, you know, it would take, you know, you could do this many calculations from here to the moon to measure you know, how good it is. Um, but I would kind of like to kind of go over how these numbers, what they mean and what they mean for you guys if you do do any computing. And um, what that means is uh, you have to kind of look at sort of three basic ideas. One is kind of the chips doing the mathematics. But then you also have to sort of think of how those chips are laid out, you know, how many motherboards per chip, how many cores per chip. Um, and then you have to really think about how fast these computers can talk to each other. They're crying, baby. <laughs> it's, it's my baby. <laughs> um, so these are, the, you, know, these, you know, you can't really just talk about flops. You have to actually think about these three numbers. And these, so they all sort of dictate what kind of simulations you're able to do. So um, first, I'll just sort of focus on this top, which is, you know, if we're talking about a CPU, how fast does it go? Well, it's a pretty simple equation. It's two, no two numbers. Um, one is the CPUs, the, the megahertz, the hertz of the computer, the clock speed, so order gigahertz usually. And then there's another number which, you know, depending on how much you guys know, it's CPUs tend to be able to do multiple jobs at once. So even your laptops are parallel a little bit. So, you know, I, so I ran a test on my laptop. My laptop actually has pretty sophisticated, <laughs> art, you know, it can do that sophisticated operation. It's just very slow. But it has, it can, it's 1.8 gigahertz, but it can do eight operations per cycle. So what I, I can actually get um, 14 gigaflops on my computer. It's, it's can't contain itself. And um, so if you look at this, um, if I was just going to look at the performance of, oh, so if I just want to do a very simple operation, which is take two vectors, multiply them, add it to another vector, and then say the outcome, how fast can I do that? Well, if you look at it, um, it's actually quite all over the place, depending on the size of the vector. So, you know, you see the numbers in the, mega, in the, um, the CPUs, what they report, you'll see good performance. It really, the performance you get depends on the testing. And, big surprise, when they report the test, they tend to do it around here. <laughs> there, there's one test out here at 100, and there's one test out here at 1,000. Actually, it's logarithmic. They're probably right next to each other. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and I mean, there's a couple of things to note. One is, my computer can't even get its optimum. It gets half of its optimum, which is about 7,000 megaflops. And, and the other point is, if I turn on the optimizations, you know, the O2, O3, if you guys are familiar with compiling your code, it's, the blue line is the optimal, and it's 
Sometimes it's better, but sometimes it's actually worse than just regular compiling code. <laughs> and so some of the reason for that, um, actually, uh, I was going to ask if anybody had ideas, but this is a pretty big room, so maybe I'll just go at it. Um, I will tell you the first one, why do I only get half? It's because this is an interesting test. My processor can only load in two numbers at once. This operation involves three numbers. So, and this is a much more typical operation than the tests that the supercomputers use. They actually engineer it to, say, replace this with a constant. I'll get into that later. So, that's just sort of an example of, you know, when to be skeptical of flop reporting from supercomputers reports. Um, but the other reason is is that you have the computers are actually CPUs actually have the hierarchy of memory. So, you know, they have their cache line at the top, which is really just some super, super fast memory where it's actually doing the arithmetic. But most of the time, the, the CPU is spending most of its work shuffling memory constantly. It's getting it from the storage to the RAM to all these sub-layers of memory in your computer, which determine the speed. And if you look at this figure, if I've sort of put where the lines are for the various caches. And you can see that as as you start needing more and more memory, the computer really is struggling more and more to keep up with how fast the processor can do its math. So even though processors can do math very quickly, they can't always get to it very quickly. And so, in fact, you'll notice I couldn't even run the optimized one out here because the optimized code crashed <laughs> when it tried to use memory. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, an example is basically optimized, op super optimized code tends to assume everything's okay. It tends to assume that I can, you know, everything's available and there won't be any problems, but then when there is problems, everything gets clogged up and the CPU has to do all this scheduling to fix it. So, yeah, I mean, what you kind of see is performance really kind of only matters up to vectors of about a thousand. So when you're doing your, your climate modeling, you really don't want to manipulate more than about a thousand numbers at a time. And you know that's a problem when you're really talking about millions of grid points to, to get a sufficient uh, resolution of the Earth. And um, just some other points is that really, while you hear about all these numbers, the, the amount of memory in your computer really doesn't affect that. You kind of have to write your code to avoid that scenario. Because if you are writing code that depends on the amount of memory you have available, <laughs> then you're going to have crappy performance. So. At the moment, you know, I said a thousand because that's where my chip, uh, my computer crapped out. Um, that, that's about typical. I think there's nothing special about the chips in here and the chips in, say, Australia's computer. Um, but yeah, so you can see that even a CPU, you have to be quite cautious on the size and you want to kind of make sure you're not using too much, you're not trying to do too much at once when you write your code. Um, but even ignoring that, there's been a bit of a crisis in computing. Um, I guess you guys, you guys all know Moore's Law. You ever heard of it? Anyone hasn't? It says transistors per chip will keep going exponentially until we die. Uh, it's obviously <laughs> not a law, but <laughs> it's, it's actually been hyper-exponential. <laughs> but um, basically what's happened is that while Moore's Law has amazingly held, um, this, this, this green line is the amount of uh, transistors per CPU. Um, the clock speed has actually stopped at around, around 2,000 new or something. Um, and that's been true for these other things too, which is performance and clock speed. And you know, we see why performance stopped. Basically, computers haven't gotten any faster for a decade, over a decade. So clock speed has been stuck at 3 gigahertz. Um, and does anyone, I don't suppose anyone knows why. But, you know, oh, did you, did you want to sit there? I was just going to throw out a couple of <laughs> Like, someone told me this would be nonsense, but it's got to do with the fact that the more you make things more miniature, um, the more, like, the probability of an electron being within a certain wire is spread out, so you can get buried. That's what I thought for a very long time, and I went around telling everyone that as well. <laughs> 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 it turns out we're not quite there yet. We're, we're very close, you know, we're like a factor of three to the kind of point where quantum mechanics starts to matter. <laughs> but the truth is, it's just a heat problem. Like, they actually, you know, they could start using slightly more exotic, like germanium has had a big, big um, role lately in getting smaller, getting, get, keeping that transistor growth rate. But the truth is, they can't get the heat out of the chips anymore. <laughs> 
<laughs> they've gotten so hot, you know, if you probably build a PC, you notice the heat sinks have gotten this big and the fans have gotten this big too. <laughs> and so it's become, it's become almost impossible. So basically, um, chip designers have given up. They say, this is too hard. Why don't we just put more chips in our computers? <laughs> So, whereas this is the old model where you'd have your CPU that would do, you know, emulate mathematics and then you'd, you'd be flip, flipping memory in and out, they said, well, why don't we just put multiple CPUs on there and then, then we don't have a problem. Then we're doing four times as much work, right? Well, no, because it's quite difficult to program four things that can talk together. But even this sort of hit its limit for kind of partly for the reasons I said, but also just because it became too slow to shuffle this memory to these four chips. So in fact, what happened is they started putting more memory <laughs> and they started putting more, more, more dies with more chips. And so now we, now we have eight times as much computing power, but unfortunately it's so spread out that they can't really talk to each other. Um, so if that became a problem. So they said, well, why don't we start syncing the memory between the two chips? So it's kind of like we still have the same memory. But what ended up is the speed performance. It ended up saying if this guy wanted memory over there, it ended up working but being slower. So you can see that CPU designers have kind of gone all this, they've, they've been struggling to keep up to kind of maintain that supercomputer performance. You know, if you look at, you know, LinPack top 500 CPU numbers, it's gone up. You can see that, I mean, the Chunghe is twice of the previous computer, and I'm sure, I'm sure the other ones will be even faster. Um, um, allegedly, K-Computer is not done yet. Um, so, you know, these computers are designed to be expanded. But, um, but you can see there's a problem. Um, but this is kind of where the story stops for us normal people. Um, for the supercomputer people, they just said, well, why don't we, why don't we put more computers together? <laughs> and so <laughs> so um, that's kind of where supercomputing is right now. You just you know, you have your little cores in here, and then you have your chips, and, and you have your memory, but then, you know, now, now it's all over the place. And, you know, this, you could just make it as big as you want and go forever, right? And that's, that's the idea behind supercomputing right now. So, um, the problem is, how do you code for that? And, you know, you have to somehow think about many, many things when you write a climate model or any numerical model these days. You have to think about, can I actually split this up into n jobs? And when I do that, do those n jobs depend on other things going on? And even, you know, and then you have to deal with kind of this hierarchy of problems. Is if I'm going to write something that is fast, say, locally for my eight CPU cores, do I have a problem if this guy, if, say, this guy here needs memory that's only speedy for the other guy? And, and then you have to deal with this bigger problem is what if that computer over there needs data from the guy all the way over there? And so you have this very um, problem where you have all these tremendous time scales that as a developer you have to work around. And the reality is most people just give up and write crappy code and then the problem comes up and then they fix it. You know, you, you don't try to kind of psychically into it how to masterfully do this. But, I mean, that it's, it's a problem and it it makes it difficult to really s look at the numbers on a supercomputer and say, oh, my, my code's going to run so much faster. I mean, just an example is, you know, I, I mean, my main job is I support the ocean modeling group here, and I don't expect the model to run any faster on the new computer. I think it might run twice as fast for that, that operations per cycle point, but I'm not betting on it. Um, yeah, so... I, yeah, so this kind of goes into the point. So Amdahl's law is that <laughs> these, <laughs> these guys, they like to use the word law for <laughs> pretty <laughs> stupid stuff. But, <laughs> but it's not gravity. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, they're, they're very rich, so they can do so well. Uh, this, this guy left the uh, Cray or somewhere and became a millionaire of his own company. He got bought by Fujitsu. Uh, um, so, you know, you can just imagine a very simple case where, you know, if, say, P is the fraction of code that you can parallelize and 1 minus P is the fraction you can't. Well, then it's not, you know, you just, you're just saying that the time spent on P can be com completely reduced and reduced by adding more and more computers. But then there's always going to be a piece that isn't. And, you know, that number is not going to be very large usually. It's, you know, these plots show what happens if, say, half your time is spent on serial work. Uh, three quarters. 
excuse me, half your time is on parallel work, three quarters, 90%, 95%. And I mean, you, know, you, you don't need a graph to see where this is going, but you know, you can just imagine if 95% of your code could be parallelized, that means you're only going to be able to get a 20, 20 times improvement. So parallelizing your code probably isn't even very useful in that situation. Um, so you can see that when, say, I parallelize, I don't parallel, I, I take someone else's code and run it at 1,000 CPUs, that means I'm saying it's 99.9% .9 parallelizable, and I'm still, you know, and I probably can't do any better. So, you know, it's it's this question of, you know, is he, I think he's, he, I mean, he's just making a very good point, which is there's a limit from the parallelization that really doesn't have anything to do with your hardware. Um, this is a crap slide I should have deleted, but I'll just use it to introduce. Um, so, when you um, look at these two things, the p and one minus p. Um, the P is obviously the mathematics, you know, the vectors that you kind of split up into pieces and, you know, you, you add up, you try to add up all the numbers separately to the best you can or, you know, or do whatever arithmetic. And 1 minus P, it's not really the system stuff, it's not the I.O., it's really the communication. It's the time of, if I have my two vectors and I'm adding them together or, you know, multiplying various things, you know, index relationships, Mo how much time does it take for the vector A to get its numbers from, say, another computer off in the network in the distance? And so really, you're talking, talking about calculation and communication. And so really, the goal in parallel computing is, you know, how do I get rid of that communication? And so it sort of presents various ways to construct a network. This is obviously the dumbest one. Um, the serial network is you just take all your computers and daisy chain them. But you know, if you have Ethernet, you just plug them in and you, know, you have a you have a network. And if computer A needs something, it has to go through the whole network to get to the end. Um, but you know, topologically, you can just stitch the end together, and you have reduced your max distance by a half. So you know, um, you can do these things, and then you can go to a mesh. So basically, now you have some kind of honest topology to your network where you talk about neighbors and distance and all these things have meanings. Um, and then you can, you can make that a torus as well by connecting the ends. Um, just, uh, and then you can go to higher dimensions. It <laughs> <laughs> by the way, so the K computer has something called 60. So basically, every single every single node on the on the K computer has five wires flying on it, and it, th there's these photos on the internet. They look like mad scientist tubes or something. <laughs> but um, I mean, the idea is each one of these reduces your max distance by n to the one over d power. So um, it's different, but it gets very expensive because you have to create sort of network arc technology that can handle all these messages flying around. Um, so actually, that's not really the direction things are going in. I mean, the example is K-Computer had to go to six dimension to get good performance. Um, that's not the way things are going. That's not what, say, Raijin uses and and use old computer Vaya. Well, excuse me, NCI's um, <coughs> previous top computer Vaya. Um, they they actually use kind of a proper network where you have switch boxes, which is much more how, like, say, the actual internet works. Um, so, like, if a computer needs something, it's a, it, it kind of tags a bunch of data saying where it needs to go and sends it to a switch box, and the switch box says, oh, I, I know where to put that. And so, I mean, it, it reduces the problem of needing so many wires and so many connections, but it kind of creates the problem of overhead to process that, that communication. But, I mean, really, you know, as, as a developer and as a user, the main point is just to be aware that communication is very difficult and it is unfortunately the most important challenge in running your models. For example, on the Maw Motion model that I support most of my time on, I think it spends 30% of its time on communication on, on a standard kind of high res run. So, you know, you can you can get all you can get all the performance you want, but if you're spending a third of your time just getting the numbers to the right place to do the arithmetic, then you know, it, it demonstrates that communication is sort of the most important part in a supercomputer, really. And, it, you know, the megaflop numbers never report that. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of just illustrate quickly why. Okay, yeah, I said that. The internet connection is often the slowest part. And suppose you have 20 people running models on a supercomputer. Suddenly it has to fight with all the other models to get its messages through that network. Never mind all the people waiting to get on in the background saying hurry up and finish. 
So, you know, as a developer and as a user, you have to be. It, it's help. It's useful to be aware of the the you know the storm that you're fighting. Um, and just quickly, I'll kind of explain why Linpack is good but not great. So, let's take. So these are the two main computers supported by NCI here in Australia. And uh, Bayou is a bunch of Xeons. It's the old Nehalem chips, which can do four operations per cycle. So we should get 140 teraflops. Uh, Raijin actually is Sandy Bridge, so it's more similar to my laptop. It gets eight. It has four times as many cores. So it should ideally be a petaflop machine. Um, Linpack is the test that we use to kind of measure kind of the baseline of a supercomputer. Uh, it's a basic um, LU decomposition of a matrix. I don't even know why I wrote that equation. I really just wanted to fill the white space. <laughs> but if you care, I mean, you take you, it, it randomly generates a matrix of some size, different depending on the test. Um, you split it up into a lower mat lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular, and the P represents the pivoting, which means you are permitted to move the rows around to to speed that up. Yeah? Sorry. Does it actually do ILU decomposition? Composition or does it do ILU? Because like... Mm. <laughs> What's ILU? <laughs> Sorry? What's ILU? Uh, incomplete lower upper. Uh, I, I mean, it's a proper LU. Because I was under the impression that LU decomposition you couldn't do on a distributed memory machine. Ah, uh, yes you can. Um, <laughs> yes, you can do it. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I don't know enough about ILU. Uh, I will. S I mean, I will tell you a slightly different trivia point. Trivia point about the test is it doesn't use the fastest LU decomposition. It actually uses a slightly inefficient algorithm, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's for the purpose of standardization more than anything. It's an n-cubed algorithm. Um, um, but what they don't do is actually um, maybe, maybe this hints at what you're saying. They don't insist on you running their code. They just say. There's, there's a simple test where they do say you have to run their code, but there's a more higher level test where they say, just do an LU decomposition using such and such algorithm that's n cubed, and you know, and then you're you're free to optimize it as you wish and do whatever you think you need to do to get the best result. But it is actually a direct solve. It's not a. S it, it actually does the matrix inversion. It doesn't solve for the say the x that would be a times x. If that's yeah, it, yeah it, is, it is the construction of the matrix. And it's also a randomly generated matrix. So, you know, does that, is that, <laughs> you know, you, some matrices are going to be faster to solve than others, particularly from the pivoting. Um, I, I should say, if you guys want to interrupt at any time, I, I'm happy because I'm probably nearly done and we're only been a half hour here. <laughs> so, I'm more than happy to be interrupted at any time if you guys have questions. Uh, Okay, um, yeah, I'll just say that just kind of reflecting back to the vector triad test that I didn't explain verbally but was on the slide. Um, most of the work in, in um, the LU decomposition is in just doing a scalar vector multiplication and arithmetic. By the way, it's two, off, it's two loads, not three, so it doesn't suffer from the vector triad problem, which is a more typical operation in, a, say, a climate code. Um, and on top of that, it's essentially easily divided up. So you just take your vector, split it up into pieces, shuffle them off to the different computers, and just do the operation. There's no index references outside of you know, the local point. So it perfectly scales. <laughs> and it doesn't depend at all on communication <laughs> until it's done. So it's a non-communicate. It's almost communication is kind of a secondary matter in, in LINPAC, in, in the top 500 tests. So when these supercomputers are giving you these numbers, they're really telling you a test that is designed to prove how manly they are. <laughs> they're not. They're not some kind of oper You know, they're not. Bye bye, Finn. They're not really application. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that, that's all this line of thing. So as a climate follower, when you hear about a supercomputer, your first question should be, how fast is the network, not how fast is the <laughs> computer. Um, so just an example of how you would go about doing that on a computer. Um, you know, this is this is not a proper projection onto a grid. I just took a picture, <laughs> and I and I forgot Antarctica, but I didn't forget it. It didn't fit. On, it didn't pile very well, so I took it out. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but you know, you can just you so so you could have like say you know one degree, quarter degree, tenth degree. That's that's where ocean modeling is going. At least atmospheres numbers are 
bit coarser, I think. But um, the direction things are going is how do you how do you model say um, so on the quarter degree model I'm doing I think there's well let's do ten degree um, that'll be about thirty six hundred times uh, eighteen hundred so you know it's in the millions on the amount of points you need to model so you know the easy thing is to just well tile the planet tile your grid literally split it up into boxes and then run each box on a computer. Obviously you would do many more than 50. You know, we use a thousand a mom. Um, and atmospheric codes are not, it's not, not exactly about tiling since some of them are spectral, but it's the same, same idea, divide up your problem. Um, but the question is, um, how about, what if, you know, how do you get, you know, the nice thing about fluid codes is they're local. You know, the, the, the ocean currents or atmospheric currents here don't care about what's going on here. They only care about the pressure field. You know, they do care what's going on here, but it has to go as a wave or current down here and around there. And, you know, so in terms of operations, fluid models are extremely local, and they really only depend on their neighbors. But that means that, say, if you want to figure out the fluxes from, say, computer node 31 to 32, you have to add halo points. So often they pump up, they actually beef up their grids a little bit by adding these halos, which are additional grid points that are shared between, say, computers 25 and 24. And so the only communication involved in a climate model is just constantly updating these halos. I call them boundary cases. But, um, so, you know, it's funny. Um, when, when I run other models, most of the time is spent waiting the corners is the biggest problem <laughs> because they involve kind of I don't I don't know I, I, I guess they just not must not be as close network wise but we had a code where it all the time was spent waiting on the corners and we can never figure it out but it's this you know and often you're only talking like four grid points out of say you know these tiles usually around they're usually around 50 by 50 do you know why that might be well um, it's it's not sorry. Is there any L3 or like that? Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's not the only reason, but basically parallelization kind of craps out at around 50 by 50. And I don't think that's a coincidence. That's about when you start to hit the L1 cage limit. You know, I only had one there. Generally, when you do climate arithmetic, you have about 10 vectors you're manipulating at a time. You know, because you have pressure, you have like the velocity fields, you have various tracers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really, the L1 cage. I've never checked this, but I think it pretty much defines the size of your tile per computer. So, um, yeah, so it, it's actually still a pain in the ass because you have to do, like, imagine you have 1,000 CPUs. You're waiting on eight neighbors for 1,000 computers, and never mind they're fighting network traffic. They're also, you know, it's just a very long operation. So um, it's difficult, but anyway, um, I guess I'm just, that's pretty much all I have to say about you know, climate modeling on supercomputers in general, but I thought that I would just kind of wrap up by giving an overview about what things are going on in the center since this is a COE winter school. <laughs> but um, the main kind of umbrella term for climate modeling, at least in Australia, is access. Um, access is really quite a bit bigger than I know of it <laughs> because. It actually has been kind of used to describe just about every single modeling effort in, say, CSIRO or the Met Bureau or whatever. But, you know, there's access G, there's access R, there's access A, there's access T for tropical, there's access, uh, there's C, access C for cities. <laughs> so there's all these, these, like, access efforts. But in the center, I would say we don't really care about those. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, please, if somebody does use them. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure that really the center is, is mainly, it's, I mean, it's all, it's all academic staff. And for the most part, that means you're really interested in climate modeling comparison results. Is that, does everyone, does anyone contest me on that? I just sit in the world, ocean world where they don't even care about sea <laughs> 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 Um But anyway, uh, I didn't hear any objection. But really, I, I think the ones that are of interest to to the center is really Access CM, which is the group, the coupled model that Cocker put together. And then there's OM, maybe maybe only the ocean group to pair with it, but that's basically the CM without the atmosphere. 
um, which is, has some bit of standardization behind it in terms of testing. And then there's the project I've been involved with, which is Access OEP. I think the EP means eddy permitting. Um, I, I saw them change that name so many times that uh, it, it doesn't even matter anymore. <laughs> but um, Access OEP is sort of trying to be the high resolution. So we're trying to, that, that when I talk about the 1,000 CPUs, that's what I'm talking about. Um, but so um, Simon Marslin is sort of the head of the development, not, not the head of the team, but um, he's the head of the development of Access CM. And the way he puts it is that you know, when you build an Australian model, you basically steal from everyone else and put it together. <laughs> so, 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 um, so the, the UM um, at the UK Met Office provides the atmosphere. Um, the ocean is provided by GFDL's MOM ocean model. Sea ice provided by Los Alamos's SICE or sea ice. Um, and if Andy Pittman were here, I don't think he is, he would say the only Australian part of access is cable, which was <laughs> the land model. And there's also a um, coupler that manages the connections between the various models. Um, but Simon is joking around when he says that. The, the, real, the real driving effort was, can we stitch in a truly open source climate model out of components that were you know, developed by an open source community? For example, MOM may be a GPL model, but I can point to s enormous pieces of it that were written by Australians. So Australia's made tremendous contributions to MOM. And I think that must, I th I've heard that the UK, the UN is actually a bit of a collaborative effort between um, uh, Australia, the UK, and Korea, which are the three countries that really um, make operational use of the UN. So yes, I mean, it truly is, it's an effort to make open source development. And MOM has made a lot of progress on that, I think. And I assume the others have as well. Um, so there's various ways you can stitch a client coupled model together. It becomes a new problem because not, you're not just talking about tiling or parallelizing. You're talking about now I have these independent applications that have their own way of doing things. And how in the world do I get them to talk together? Well, in fact, it's really hard and I've never been very good at it. But one way of going about it is to introduce a coupler, Oasis, which was developed at CNRS in France. And um, so Oasis really acts as a, not just a message passer, but an, an interpolator between the various grids. And so it acts as a medium to get MOM updated with, say, its ice and atmosphere fields. And so it, Oasis keeps these three together. And Cable does not have, a, my understanding is Cable does not have a direct link to the UN. It's, excuse me, to, to the other models. It, it's only, it only communicates to the UN and then the UM communicates those impacts by the other models. Um, I, I don't know a lot about the atmospheric side of things people here do, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But um, that's not the only way to do things. This is how GFDL does it, for example. Um, there's really no rules in how you go about this. Um, you know, the ocean talks to the ice in, in GFDL, and in fact, it's kind of a complicated loop where all three talk to each other. It's not a loop, but you know, all three of the upper components are constantly in communication in the time looping, time stepping in the GFDL. So there's really, designing your, your climate model is not just about tiling and memory size and all this stuff. It's actually about, you know, are there physical and computational reasons to manage the communications between your components? And, you know, when do you do it? Like, for example, ice and land tend to be very low, low need because they're not doing nearly as much calculations in general. So you generally want to keep those small, whereas the ocean does a lot, but the atmosphere is often the biggest burden, not because of the grid size, but because of the time step. Because atmospheres, atmosphere just kind of went in the direction. They decided to model every single wave <laughs> in the atmosphere, <laughs> you know, and that included the gravity waves. And that meant they needed hourly, you know, very, very small time steps. Probably sub hourly, I don't even know anymore. Yeah? Have you made a connection there between the ocean and the atmosphere? No. 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 And not, not, not in mom. No. In mom, mom actually has something called the ice ocean boundary. And so any impact of the atmosphere has to be communicated via the ice model. And why? I don't, I mean, from the architecturally, it's probably a lot simpler. <laughs> What? They have this, this ice layer all over the entire ocean. That's it may, e <laughs> may, it may not have ice in it. Even, if, even <laughs> over land. Remember, it's not ice. There is no ice in Mom. There's sea ice. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> 
And yeah, so you have to have this ice ocean boundary even if you have no ice or ocean. <laughs> Uh, another point that I didn't really say is, you know, land creates a load problem as well here, where obviously here you don't need to do much ocean, well, <laughs> but so, for, you know, in mom I do it because I'm, I'm lazy. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, to do like to do ideal load balancing, you have to even worry about the amount of calculation in your grid. You have to worry about the amount of calculation your components need. And all of that, and that's that's how you optimize these things. And no, no one does a great job of it. And the tools are hard to use because it's hard. How do you use a debugger when you have a thousand computers, a thousand applications running? So you know these things are very challenging. Um, yeah. So I think in the end, so that's all I have to say about that. I think I'll just sort of run through how one uses a supercomputer, at least here. I mean, these these rules are not going to apply other where, other places, but. You know, we don't just have our computer, which is Raijin and Bayou. We also have other computers that we use for, say, you know, calculating mean fields and global things. You, you know, you don't necessarily want to do everything in the model because that's asking for a very expensive computer to do what might just be, you know, averaging 100 numbers. So we have DCC for doing um, sort of post processing of model output. Ooh. And then we have DC, which is for moving data around. That's another thing. Like a lot of people will log into their supercomputers and start copying gig terabytes of data around. And you know, I think there's a better use for the computer. So generally speaking, you know, it's always good to have dedicated computers for file transfers as well. Um, and then we also have a tape drive. Uh, no one uses it anymore. <laughs> tape sucks. Uh, oops. So um, if you got, for the people that are here in the CoE and do use the computer, generally you don't really get to decide if you get to use it. You have to have a grant. But if you, if you do work for someone that has a grant, it's very easy to get an account and they will SMS you your details and then it's also quite easy to get connected to the project of your supervisor. And there's some text there that's not that interesting. But, and I can't get it anywhere. Um, so I thought I'd also just sort of quickly explain what's happening when you log in to, say, Australia's computer. This is why you, I, I, Raijin's brand new, I don't know. But basically, you don't, when you log into a supercomputer, you're not actually in the computer. You're in a bunch of login nodes. So Bayou has four, I think, it, I think it has four, maybe it only has three. But anyway, you don't actually get much say in which one you go to. Generally, they have some load balancing stuff, network load balancing stuff. It keeps people on there. And then when you do run stuff, you actually submit it to the interconnect. In this case, it's InfiniBand. Uh, it's a quad data rate. Uh, I will say, I didn't mention, Raijin actually uses FDR, which is, I think, 14 instead of quad, which is four. That's just four times faster and 14 times faster than some than the original hardware. So, um, and then, then the InfiniBand talks to all the, the there's, there's over a thousand of these on Bayou. I only drew 27. <laughs> I have limited patience, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how to script the <laughs> script drawing. Um, but yeah, I mentioned this because sometimes people log into their nodes and they start running their model without submitting. <laughs> but there's actually a lot of people logged in there, and sometimes they're trying to work, and you've slowed everything down. So when you do log into a supercomputer, try not to do anything big <coughs> when you're logged in. Try to Try to send it to the supercomputer to do the work. Um, compiling is usually okay, but don't run don't run your models. <laughs> um, so our file system is not like everyone's, but it's pre probably pretty typical. Um, we all have home directories. They tend to not have much space, so you can't put your forcing fields and stuff and your model executables in there. You generally just put your configuration files. Some people put their code, but even codes are starting to get a little too big. So most people actually keep their code under some kind of version control. And um, most of your working stuff is on some short-term space on, on NCI, they call it short. And um, it's usually sorted by project, which is the project you would have been assigned to. Um, and that's where you generally tend to actually run your model. It used to be in the old days you had to worry about different computers having different file systems and computer A couldn't necessarily see the files of computer B unless it was in a special space. But 
since I've been here, they fix all that, and now we have a Lustre file system that's very good, and it means pretty much every computer sees every single file. And I don't have a slide showing it, but there is a bit of delay in terms of updating. So if you update, say, if, say value number 55 edits a file, there is a bit of delay where Lustre has to go and edit that file on all the other computers, or at least, it's not all the computers, it's a separate thing. There's about 100 of these file computers. But um, basically, the, as the user, it seems very straightforward, like you just have one file system and one file, and all the computers are the same. It's not quite true. Sometimes you'll encounter that, but for the most part, you're lucky. Um, and then we also have some kind of midterm space. Uh, actually, I just got an email saying, don't use this. <laughs> Forget that. Uh, uh, we're lucky in terms of software support. We use environment modules, which I've become a big fan of. Um, basically, if you need a compiler, you don't ask anyone to install it for you. It's already installed. You just type module load and then the name of in, you know, Intel CC for C compilers. If you need a library, MPI is kind of the standard message passing library for different nodes talking to each other. You just type module load and open MPI and you know if you want Python. So you know it creates a very dynamic software environment that I think is quite convenient for people on, on the NCI computers. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not putting these things up as tutorials. NCI has a whole hour-long talk for teaching you how to use their system. I'm obviously not going to try to do that. Um, but I, I just want to kind of overview it. Um, when you run jobs on NCI, you don't actually run them. You submit them. You ask for permission to run them, and then the supercomputer gods say, you know, yes, you may. <laughs> and then they give, they give you however many processors you asked for, say 100 or 1,000 or even one, and they let you run it. And there's a, there's a tool to check how you're going. Um, I could check that if I could put that up if you guys want, but really I probably won't. Um, and you tend to have, but because of this, you tend to have budgets when you run your applications on the supercomputer. Um, excuse me, I'm getting a little skip there. <laughs> uh, you, you have a CPU hour budget. So if your model takes an hour and it's using 100 CPUs, you have to deduct 100 hours from your quarterly budget to run stuff. So you're not just given a right to run things until you know consuming that megawatts of power just so you can fix a bug in your code. That, that, that there you are managed a little bit in terms of that. Um, I will say it's not a real economy. You know, people, some people dive in and go crazy and run out of hours all the time. Some people get really cautious about it. I, I will say dive in because it's not a real economy. <laughs> Just take what you can, and if you run out, beg for more, and they'll usually give it to you. <laughs> but, but, I mean, the point is, there is some quasi economy there, and you should try to be a responsible user. Uh, there's ways to check these things. Um, you t yeah, when you, when you submit jobs, you have to sort of say how many cores you want, how long you plan to run it, and how much memory you need. Um, you can see, because of the node nature of things, there's a limit to how much memory you can take. For example, um, each, each motherboard, each node on value only has 24 gigs of memory. So if you ask for one CPU and 80 gigs, you're not going to get it because it's not physically possible. Um, if you ask for one node and 24 gigs of memory, you're probably not going to get that either because other people might need memory. So generally, um, the rule is about 3 gigs per CPU. So if you're asking for, if you're asking for memory, you know, don't expect to get more than about three gigs per CPU. And the other thing is, when you request your CPUs, remember there's that nodal environment. You know, on Bayou, it's eight, it's eight cores per node. So you, you can't really ask for nine CPUs. You can, but you're sort of asking for one compute, one node, and then I, I only need one piece of it, but can I have the whole thing? So, <laughs> so they say no. So what you do is you ask for 16 and only use nine. But, <laughs> but. <laughs> But, um, you know, and then wall time is the biggest killer because your code will, it's hard to really know how much time you need to run a model. And this is, this is really a flaw in the system. I mean, there's no way to kind of request more in midway <laughs> at the moment that I know of. So usually people get, you know, you'll ask for an hour and it'll take an hour and five minutes and you'll just get so upset because... <laughs> because it's just finished, and then it didn't finish, and it'll delete all your stuff, and you'll be all... <laughs> but um, So you have to kind of get a sense in the wall time. And remember, the more wall time you ask for, the less likely you're going to get on the system. 
Um, but I think that kind of explains, you know, where, you know, that resources is something you have to think about as a supercomputer user. Because these are very special computers, and only very special people get to use them. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip that. Basically, they're, they're, they're usually some kind of express queue, but it means there's limits on how fast you can use it. That, that's good for testing, actually, I will say. There tend to be express queues where you only can use, say, up to 16 CPUs, and you're almost guaranteed to get on in a few minutes. But as I said, you can only use 16 CPUs. Uh, there's usually a copy queue. Uh, they use this for I.O. I tend to use it for anything that is a single processor job. It, it sort of guarantees I get on quicker. But So I mean, the, I guess the idea is sometimes c supercomputers have these queues, and you want to think about which one you really need for your particular job. Um, so questions are, you know, when you're running a model, is my, does my mo is, why is my model slow? You know, um, does it scale? You know, did you actually check your code to see if you double the amount of CPUs that the wall time actually, you know, went down, didn't go up? Sometimes it will. You know, if I tried to run, say, the high resolution model on 3,000 CPUs, I wouldn't, it'd probably take longer than if I used 1,000. Um, sometimes it's because your communication is too high. There's profiling tools to check that. Um, they, they, they have a funny case on the NCI site. They have there's the gold model, and there's a model they, they call poor. The gold model had 30% communication, which is considered good, and the poor model had 1%, 99% communication. <laughs> so they were spending all their time passing messages between the nodes and not doing any actual calculation. <laughs> so, you know, this is a reason why your models will run slow sometimes. And then sometimes you're just waiting too long on the queue because you're asking for too much. Uh, so yeah, just I took an hour. Oh, wow, and <laughs> talk too much. And um, so yeah, I mean, when it comes down to CPU performance, it's not just about the top 500 number. It's really about it's really about you know the CPU that was used to build it, but also about the core node infrastructure and also about the speed of the interconnect that's saying how fast it can talk. And uh, that that second point is incomplete. But basically, when you run a model, manage your resources. I think that's all I got. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. I'm confused about the difference between uh, core and CPU. There's no difference, really. Um, I guess some people might say a CPU has multiple cores, mm -hmm. like in that picture I had with the four. But when I say core, I mean computational unit. So a core is, is as I said, so like um, Raijin has, let's go to Bayou. Bayou has about 2,000 CPUs, but um, 11,000 cores. Wait, I don't, you, you <laughs> times eight, <laughs> times four. It has, it has about four times as many cores as CPUs. That's probably a fair distinction. Hmm? Yeah? In, in the previous slide, uh, what do you mean with uh, this one? My code is scaling? Oh, I mean, does if I, if I mean back to Amdahl's law, actually. Um, if I use more CPUs, does my code run twice as fast? Ideally, it's going to run twice as fast. It won't. It'll run, say, 1.9 times as fast. If I double again, it might run 1.7 and so on. And you know, as a user, you kind of have to decide at what point am I, am I being irresponsible and you know, obvi obviously there, there's the two limits where <laughs> there's no benefit to adding CPUs. But, you know, for example, I always run models slightly inefficient because we have the budget for it and it's not a real economy. So, <laughs> so <laughs> but you know, it's like, it's really, I mean, as a user, all you care about is the time it takes. As the, as the supercomputer administrator, they want you to be the most efficient. So, but that, that's that's a bit of a follow-up to your question, I think. Uh, there was you and someone back there. But yeah, there's two ones that I want to the timeline. For example, I want to make it for the supercomputer that you want your GPM to forgive by running one in the other. Okay, um, I'll tell you the ocean side. So we have a 1,000 CPU job. Um, it's a quarter-degree ocean model. Um, it takes about four hours to run that for a model year. And that's obviously a function of how many cores we use and stuff like that. But in terms of, so that the high resolution quarter degree ocean model, we get about four hours. 
But again, the number really depends on the machine. For example, I'm hoping to God we get two hours on Raijin because it can do twice as many operations per cycle. Um, on another computer, um, I didn't talk about vector computers at all. They'll have completely different numbering relationships. But you know, as a human being, you want you want to get about a few hours per year. <laughs> you know, some people can't get that. They get a you know a, a model year per day. But you know, atmospheres actually atmospheres tend to be a lot harder than oceans to run because of that because they take more time. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, was that a good enough answer? <laughs> okay. Is your domain decomposition really the proof of those 50 boxes you had up there, or do you have an algorithm for like decomposing all the oceans in more even uh, We Ours is pretty bad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about unstructured grids, or do you just mean more sophisticated selection of... Well, I'm, I, I don't know if you're using finite frequencies or finite elements, whatever. No, um, hardly any climate modelers use finite elements. Um, th these are all these are all largely speaking finite volume codes. Uh, yeah. Some of the really older ones are finite difference. Um, um, so, but you're, do you have like an algorithm of like load balancing between processes that all of the ocean you can time, or do you just cut the world up into boxes like that? Um, we just cut it up into boxes because we're lazy. <laughs> but um, we there we do have one tool that removes land. You know, if a cell is completely land, we we just say don't don't run that. Um, but the truth is, the model is pretty good about finding those cases. Mm. Um, MOM is, I, I, most of my time is spent on the ocean model. Um, in fact, an atmospheric model doesn't tile because it's spectral. So they actually divide it up in the lines yeah. and then parallelize the, the lines. Because, I, I, correct me, but I believe spectral, you can parallelize in one direction but not the other. Um, so yeah, um, going beyond that, you really are talking about a unstructured grid. And climate modeling probably ought to go in that direction, but the efforts to have failed. ICOM was one example of that. It was in the UK, um, Imperial University. Um, Fujitsu even funded it, and it was a disaster. It, it produced terrible <laughs> results. Um, and GFDL has written papers explaining why they haven't pursued finite element. but. You know, astrophysics is there, and they're getting phenomenal. You know, they ran some code on Sequoia and got like 90% efficient, you know, of the peak. So, I mean, it can be done. They just haven't gotten there in climate modeling. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if it's because climate models are so tr utterly local, because you know they're just flux between boxes. So it works so well. So <laughs> but there shouldn't be any reason why the finite volumetric or finite difference can really become just the same object, but you can. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that finite difference in volume is kind of... Can you explain to the rest of us what those are? <laughs> finite difference means you, t you turn your derivatives into plus this minus uh -huh. the neighbor. Finite volume, you actually integrate over a sub, a, say a cube, and you actually think about the fluxes of, say, heat and momentum in and out of these boxes. Okay. And finite volume is preferred because you can actually do interpolations that give you phenomenal spatial accuracy. But then you just you lose all that accuracy in the time stepping, so it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so some people say, why bother? But it, it produces tremendous accuracy in terms of preserving temperature and salinity and stuff like that. So it's actually pr preferred for that reason. Yeah? Um, well, climate models are not really changed. Oh, I'm Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know more little about it. Uh, you know more than me. Okay. I don't know. Every time I talk to people, they say it's a big joke. Yeah. <laughs> the people that work in it, I mean, right. they they say they say they say don't don't wait. <laughs> so I'm happy to take that. You know, I only understand K CPUs. So <laughs> I would prefer I would prefer quantum computing come a bit after I retire. <laughs> nah, nah, I, I think I I don't know. It, it's such a it's such a different. It's so out there that it will it will completely change this entire discussion. If, if it does happen. <laughs> yeah? With the speed test where you have the matrix operation, you mm -hmm. put an example in the whole case. Why is, I mean, if it's supposed to be a benchmark in the test, why is the matrix random while you have just a constant so it's comparable to the uh, It's a good question. I suspect because you can engineer around a particular matrix. I don't know. I, 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 the, the honest answer is I don't know why. 
Yeah. But people can kind of fiddle with it and optimize it for a particular. I would, I would guess you could just kind of prep the memory to kind of say, you know, you know, you know, put more effort into this particular line or something. Um, I, I don't know, but I, I think random. When, when they did these reports, they actually run them for many.